We're ready to pick up here in uh, the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. If you're following along with me in your notebook, hope you are. We're on page 65 as we're we'll be following the text accordingly. So the title here at the top of page 65 is the church response to its first persecution. It was inevitable. In fact, it was promised back in Matthew chapter 10 when Jesus uh, gave his disciples the healing authority, the power over devils and uh, things like that, chapter 10, verses 1 and verse number 8, to heal diseases. In that same chapter, we read in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, that, Behold, Jesus speaking, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Well, it was predicted that they would not, that the Christians, that the apostles, that Christ himself would not be received well. So none of us should be uh, uh, surprised at that. I think that uh, we might all agree that we live in an increasingly more hostile environment to, toward Christianity in the United States of America uh, today than we have uh, in the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, I know in my lifetime, now I've got a pretty good uh, number of years behind me, I've seen things change just since the time I trusted Christ as Savior, which is going back 45 years or so, 47 years or so ago. I've seen a lot of changes in our country. Uh, just recently, uh, the um, state of New York has legalized late-term abortions. That is, you can abort a child right up to the last moment before the child is born. Nine-month abortions. That's just one of the things that has happened. And of course, uh, the state of New York, this particular governor here, Cuomo, received something like 78% of the vote in the election for governor, which gives you just a general idea what the state of this state we are the leaders in abortions. We really are. I'm embarrassed by all of that. But uh, Christians are uh, headed for persecution. If they're not already, then they are in other places in the world. We know that. But Christians are headed for persecution right here in the United States of America. Well, anyway, this prophecy was for the disciples, specifically, that they were going to face persecution. And one of the things in this chapter that I think is valuable is their response. And we spend a lot of time looking at their response. How did they respond themselves to persecution? So let's slip over to the text on page number 66. And you can read through the introduction on 65 at your leisure. On page number 66, we're going to begin looking at the, uh, exactly what takes place here, the persecution. And then if you'll notice on the top of page number 16, 67, it says the first response. And then what follows on 68 is the second, the third, etc. So that is, we're going to kind of look at this chapter from that perspective. What was the response of the disciples, of the apostles, to this early persecution. Reading with me in Acts chapter 4, in verse number 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. But being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold, we would say prison, they put them in the slammer unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. So revival is taking place here. Good things are happening. We, we said that a couple lessons ago. The church, the disciples were on a roll. Good things were happening. Well, here comes the first great obstacle to the success of the church, and that is persecution. Now, these are the same people that have crucified Christ. Remember, we're not talking about a lot of time differential from the, the crucifixion of Christ, Pentecost, and by the time we get into 
uh, Acts chapter number 4, these are the same people that have crucified Christ. They were afraid of him. They feared him. They didn't like what he said about them, Israel, their spiritual needs, them personally and their hypocrisy. Didn't like that. And now here comes the 11 apostles who are all preaching plus people who are coming into believing along the way. So the movement is, as I said, on a roll, and it's growing. Well, if the Sadducees and the scribes and the Pharisees, if they were afraid of Jesus himself, they realize that this movement is getting out of hand. What are they going to do about it? So, Peter has used the healing to be a springboard into another witnessing opportunity, which we just read of in chapter number 3. We see the second paragraph down, the priests and who they are. As I just mentioned, these are contemporaries. These are the same people that have crucified Christ. And then there's a reference to the Sadducees. The Sadducees were particularly offended at the preaching because they didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. That is Acts chapter 4, verse 2, that Peter was preaching. So they were put in prison overnight. It wasn't uh, appropriate for them to be interrogated and, uh, and dealt with at night. They did that with Jesus. They kind of overlooked that rule on, uh, on, for his, on his behalf. But here they're, being, they're following the rules, so they wait till the next day. But the le- leaders are threatened. They're threatened by, I put the phrase deja vu in here, and the success of the apostolic ministry, not to mention the incontestable healing that has just taken place in chapter number three. I mean, this was done in front of a lot of people, a lot of amazement, a lot of wondering, a lot of people bought into what the apostles were doing and believed that they were very credible in their ministry. And now, with the movement growing, these leaders have to be even more careful in how they deal with the apostles. There may be a general uprising against them that they fear. The focus of this sermon is on the response of the early disciples. How did they respond to the pressure and persecution? And I think this serves as a good example to you and to me in the day in which we live. How are we, how have we, and how are we going to respond to persecution in our own society, in our own country, in our own towns, in our own villages. Americans have not had to endure persecution of this sort yet. But as we are becoming more secularized, it's becoming much more popular to attack Christianity and Christian values. Our system and philosophy of government has protected us, but the protections seem to be eroding away. Just as recently as the year, I think it's 2003 or 2004, homosexuality was illegal in the state of Texas. It was illegal, punishable. Look where we are today in the year 2019. That was only 15 or 16 years ago. Now, if you say anything against a homosexual, you can be accused of hate speech and thrown in, ultimately, you'll be thrown in jail for it, or you'll be told they'll take your church away from you or whatever. That's what I would expect at some point. And it seems like the train is picking up speed. It's moving more and more rapidly. So that's the, the protections that you and I have enjoyed as Americans and why the church has not had to experience serious or severe persecution, things are changing. Things are changing. Chapter number four records the first persecution of the brand new church, only days old. The apostles provide an example of the proper response, okay? So let's look, top of page 67. The first response, the apostles quietly submitted to the Jewish authorities. They submitted. They had been warned of the coming persecution, Matthew chapter 10, by Jesus. If they would crucify the leader, why wouldn't they 
mistreat or abuse them or crucify them. The apostles had great confidence in the sovereign will of God. They knew and could see God working through the circumstances, the good things that were taking place, but they knew that there were trials that were on the horizon. And Peter speaks of that in 1 Peter chapter number 1. In verse 7, he uses this term. He says that the trial of your faith, <clears throat> being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. Nowhere in the Scripture are Christians promised that they will be protected from persecution any more than the apostles were protected from persecution, any more than John the Baptist was protected from persecution, any more than Jesus was protected from persecution. Part of the plan People don't like God. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Romans chapter 1 tells us men, natural men, men in the flesh, are not pro God. They're not disposed to like God or love God. That's not the way it is. And so it's a short distance from not loving God to persecuting those who do love God. Notice 1 Peter chapter 2. There's another statement by Peter, again, the preaching and the individual that we're studying in the book of Acts. He said some other things, like he said, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. In verse 14, he says, if you reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. So what was the first response? The apostles quietly submitted to the Jewish authorities. Let's read chapter 4, verse 5. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power, by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Again, the remarks are still focused at the nation of Israel. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, that is the healing of chapter number 3, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. He's kind of pouring salt in the wounds right now, is he not? He's pretty bold. Even by him doth this man stand here before you, that is the paralytic, whole. This is the stone, Jesus. This is a reference to an Old Testament prophecy that is quoted from Psalm 118. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Wow. What a response to the persecution. Now they submitted, but then when Peter had an opportunity to speak, he told them the truth. He did not mince his words. Verse number 12 is such a pop. They're all powerful verses, but verse number 12. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, by him, Jesus said. Now, that's very exclusivistic. There is one way to eternal life, and eternal life is through Christ. So what does that say about every religion, cult, that denies that truth? Either Jesus is correct, or they are correct. He's either telling the truth, Peter's telling the truth, or they're not. And you have to make a decision on that. You have to make a decision. There is a way 
And there are, in fact, the book of Proverbs says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. And certainly you can apply that passage of Scripture to salvation. Jesus is the Lord, Jesus Christ. He is the Lord, the Savior, the Anointed One of the Lord. So the second response, page 68, Peter responds by being filled with the Holy Ghost. And what follows is he seizes, response number three, he seizes the opportunity to be a witness. Again, several passages of Scripture that attest to that. Being filled with the Spirit, by the way, is being filled with the Word of God. Let the Word of Christ, Colossians 3.16, I believe, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 5. Be filled with the Word of God. What is taken in then naturally comes out. When you're in the Bible, when you have the opportunity to declare the truth of the Word of God, that's what will come out, the truth. The second response, Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost. The third response, the apostles seized the opportunity to witness, and we've given you some thoughts about that. In the top of page 69, let's read some more text in chapter 4. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they didn't graduate with their PhDs from the university, they weren't trained rabbis, trained in the law, they were essentially average individuals. As far as they were concerned, they were unlearned. They were ignorant. They marveled. Where did these people get this stuff? They have paid much more close attention to the Old Testament prophets than we have because they paid much more attention to Jesus Christ, God's representative, the Son of God. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Witness, here, here is uh, our primary uh, witness to all of these happenings. He was immediately made whole, leaping and walking and praising God. It's hard for them to deny what is taking place. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. What are we going to do here? We're kind of in a, in a bind saying, what should we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle had been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. <laughs> but that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them, and they speak henceforth to no man in his that he, they speak henceforth to no man in his name. Let's threaten them. Let's uh, say, if you ever do this again, this is what's going to happen to you. You know, that's all they had. All they had were threats. And of course, Christians today are threatened. If you talk about Jesus here or there, you know, you may be arrested. You'll be whatever the consequence is with the threat. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you should we listen to you or listen to God? By the way, we're getting our marching orders from God. We're not getting our marching orders from you. You guys just crucified the Messiah. Judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Why? Because they're witnesses. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing, how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done, the healing of the paralytic for the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. So he, from birth, I mean, he had a long history. Many, many people knew who he was, and now they saw him totally and completely restored. The fourth response, the middle of page 69, they were compelled to obey God regardless of the threats and the consequences for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard in spite of the threats. Shut up. 
Don't talk about them anymore. We're going to let you go, but we don't want to hear about this anymore ever again. Okay? We're going to get you. Meant nothing to the disciples. The result of their preaching and obedience for all men glorified God for that which was done. And that's the purpose. That was the purpose of their lives at this point. Their purpose wasn't to be tax collectors, to catch fish, to do anything else, to be police officers or uh, engineers or mechanics. Their main purpose was to bring glory to God. That's what Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 11 tells us. That is each and every one of our main purposes in life is to bring glory to God. Verse number 23. Let's read. Let's pick up this and read here. Ready? And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, notice the unity of the church, one accord, and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the whole, thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now... Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Witness that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Witness. I've used that term over and over. It's illustrated in many ways in the book of Acts. Bold witnesses, threatened by men to shut up, to not talk about Jesus, to not to share what they knew to be true with others. And they were bold witnesses. They spake the word of God. They were all filled and they spake the word of God with boldness. So this brings the fifth response. They sought the fellowship and encouragement of other believers. Let's take a moment just to go back. Look at the first response. It was at the top of 67. The apostles quietly submitted to the Jewish authorities. That's the first thing that we read. Secondly... They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Third response, the apostles seized the opportunity then to witness. Fourth response, page 69, they were compelled to obey God regardless of the threats and consequences. Fifth response, they thought fellowship and encouragement of fellow believers. This is one of the reasons why it is so important for us to come together as believers in fellowship, in church services, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We need each other to a degree. We are human beings. It would be nice if we all had this absolute faith and trust in God and we didn't need any encouragement from anyone else. That is the ideal. Certainly that's the ideal. And there are those that have lived that way under certain conditions. But we don't live under those conditions. And so we can seek the fellowship and the encouragement of other believers. They can help us. They can encourage us. When I'm down, someone else who is up, and they can lift me up. And the day will come when one of my brothers, one of my sisters is down, and I can lift that person up. We can come together 
in church services and worship services and we can praise God and we can listen to the teaching and the preaching of God's word and get strengthened and encouraged ourselves. That is so important to do. They sought the fellowship and encouragement of fellow believers. Sixth response, they rejoiced, they praised, they thanked God for they could see his hand and will in all that happened. Even the negative things, they could see God working even in the difficult things. The whole world has risen up against the Lord, but you have determined to accomplish your will in this way. Verses 26, 27, and 28 in chapter 4, which leads our seventh response. They went to the Lord in prayer and asked him to provide boldness that they might speak the word. They were witnesses. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the word of God. And what they had put in was empowered by the Holy Ghost to come out. They talked about Jesus. Think of our conversations on a daily basis. Think of the things that we talk about. We talk about our family. We, we talk about our job, our work. We talk about the sports world. We talk about so many different things. We talk about our church life. We talk about the people at church, good people that we know. Maybe sometimes we talk about bad people and we shouldn't be talking about them. But of all the conversations that you have and all the words that you speak in a day, what is the percentage of the words that you speak? What percentage of those words are positive words that are spoken as witnesses of Jesus Christ? Whether it's encouragement to a fellow believer or whether it's sharing a truth from God's word to somebody who knows little or nothing about God or the Bible himself. How do we use our mouths to communicate with others. They rejoiced and praised and thanked God. Seventh response, they went to the Lord in prayer and asked him to provide boldness that they might speak the word, which leads to verse to the excuse me, to the eighth and final response. That persecution actually strengthened them. It's not churches aren't destroyed from without. Churches are destroyed from within. In fact, we'll see in chapter number five, it's exactly what takes place. That's the potential. Churches can be destroyed from discord within, from people who are phonies, who are fakers, people who are engaged in spiritual pretense, Ananias and Sapphira we'll be talking about in the next lesson, we'll be talking about people like that. And what are the things that bring division into a church? But let's read the rest of chapter 4, the summary, and we'll take another break. 432. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart, unified, one soul. They needed to be because tough times had come upon them. Not only from without, persecution from without, but in chapter 5, there's going to be division from within. One heart, one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles, there's the word again, witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, the power of Christianity, the linchpin of Christianity, the greatest theological truth of Christianity is the literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Equality. They made sure that the needs of everyone were cared for even at their own personal expense, if need be. And they laid these things down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he hath need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, 
which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That may seem like just kind of an addendum to the chapter, but it sets up what takes place in the following chapter. Barnabas was the real deal. What follows in chapter 5, phonies, fakers, people who are pretending to be with the program, but they're really self-centered. They haven't bought in completely. Do you know anybody like that? What were the responses? Look at the summary at the bottom of 71. They quickly submitted and relied upon God. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and they sought opportunity to witness. This was the response to persecution. They obeyed God regardless of the threats and the circumstances. They sought the fellowship and encouragement of other believers. They rejoiced, praised, and thanked God for his involvement. They prayed for boldness that they might be, you know, witnesses. And they were driven together. They were united because persecution had come upon the church from without. And it just draws people to work together. It's strength. Tough times strengthen churches. They have the ability, tough times have the ability to strengthen people and churches. In fact, it's through the difficulties of life that we really learn the greatest lessons and become the best possible people that we can be. We're going to take a break right now. We'll be back just in a few moments, and we'll begin in chapter number 5.